Hi, my name's Kevin Hicks. Welcome to my YouTube channel, The History Squad. Now, today's video, controversial. Bloody Mary, Mary the First, that Tudor Queen, daughter of Henry VIII. What drove her to sanction the burning alive of so many people? So we're going to have a little look at her. And at the end of the whole business, I want you to sum up in your own mind. Did she deserve the title, Bloody Mary? Okay. So who was Mary? Yeah, we know that she became Mary the First, the first true Queen of England, shall we say. But she was somebody's child. Henry VIII and his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. That makes Mary half Spanish. She had Spanish nobles as her relatives. This young girl, born into a Catholic family, her mother, devout Catholic, she knows no other religion. This young girl is schooled in her faith and part of the Catholic faith, no divorce. So when her father and mother are divorced, Archbishop Cranmer, remember that name, actually dissolves the marriage. He must have broke her heart. One minute she's the daughter of Henry VIII, she's going to be loved and she's going to, you know, be groomed and married off and so on and so forth. Now she's cast aside. Her father remarries, uh, her mother loses title, she loses title. It must have been absolutely devastating for her. And the one interesting reflection here, apparently she had more stepmothers than she did friends. Now, as things go on, she ends up with a half-sister Elizabeth and her half-brother Edward. Now, Edward takes the throne after Henry's death. He is absolute Protestant. He guides England through this new phase, but unfortunately he gets tuberculosis, we think, uh, an infection in the lung. 1553, he dies. Now, before he died, though, he made sure that Lady Jane Grey, a cousin, would become Queen Protestant. But she only stood for nine days because Mary didn't stand idle. She raised a force and very quickly the support for poor Lady Jane Grey simply dissolved. And Mary becomes Queen of England, July 1553. One of the first things that Mary did on her accession to the throne was to actually release imprisoned Catholic uh, dignitaries. Two of them quite important, Thomas Howard, 3rd Duke of Norfolk, and Stephen Gardner, who she remade as the uh, Bishop of Winchester and her Lord Chancellor. Now, you might know that name, Stephen Gardner, from a previous video I did about the torture and execution of Anne Askew. This kind of shows you the kind of people that we are actually dealing with. Well, it was Gardner who actually crowned Mary on the 1st of October, 1553. But before she was crowned, she had leading Protestant churchmen, clergy, imprisoned, including Thomas Cranmer. But she'd issued a proclamation. I'm going to read it. Hold on. It's very simple. Uh, she wouldn't compel any of her subjects to follow her religion. So from the beginning, she's, she's leading people into a full sense of security. She's not going to compel anybody to follow in her footsteps with the Catholic religion. Yeah, well, let's have a little look into that, shall we? Shortly after Mary was crowned Queen of England, her first parliament, October 1553, sits. And her parents' uh, marriage is, is declared valid. So the divorce is abolished. Henry and uh, Catherine of Aragon, their marriage legal, so their daughter was not a bastard. There's a little twist in all of this. Also, the break with Rome, that's kicked out. All of her brother's uh, religious reforms, Edward VI, that is kicked out as well. So basically what was happening was church doctrine was being taken back to 1539, to the six articles of Henry VIII. Now, amongst these articles, was you had to have a complete adherence to the Catholic faith, believe in transubstantiation, the, uh, in communion, the, the bread and the wine actually becoming the blood and body of Christ. You also had to have priests who were celibate, believe in the confessional. There were all these different angles. Now, if you went against it, you could be fined, imprisoned, but if you recanted, hey, just a heavy old fine. But if you didn't recant, you could be put to death and all of your chattels, all of your belongings confiscated, put to death for heresy. 
By the end of 1554, a deal had been made with the Pope. People were concerned in England, you see, that the Catholic Church would be claiming back land that had been confiscated in the Reformation under Henry VIII. But that didn't happen because there were some notable families there and you don't want to put their noses out. But one thing that did come out of this deal with the Pope was the reinstatement of that heresy act. What does heresy mean? Eh? Well, I've got the definition here. A theological doctrine or system rejected as false by ecclesiastical authority. I'll tell you, that's a mouthful. It actually comes from the Greek meaning self-chosen opinion or an organization that has that same opinion. But in this case, it means that if you go against the Catholic Church, if you don't believe in what they believe in and you don't recant, you will be put on trial and you'll be found guilty of heresy and you'll be burned alive. So on top of all of this heresy business and Catholic reform, Mary decides she's going to get married. Now, she'd been urged before to marry this guy or to that guy, but she decides to marry a Spaniard, Philip II of Spain. Her own advisers tell her, don't do this. It will make you unpopular, but she won't have any of it. 1554, she marries Philip II of Spain. The problem is this. In those days, if you married, if you were a lady, you married, your husband had claim to your chattels, to your property. So in fact, Philip II will become King of England, although Mary will be the Queen of Spain. But in fact, from what I've read, they did reign jointly. It's going to cause a lot of problems for her in her reign, for there will be wars between Spain and France, and that could drag England into a war. But that's a whole different story. And if you're interested in this, have a read. Have a read about Mary because there's more to her than meets the eye. She fell in love with Philip. She adored him. But it's what happens next which earns her the title Bloody Mary. You see, it wasn't until February 1555 that the first execution for heresy actually took place. John Rogers uh, burned alive at the stake. But you've got to consider this. Mary only reigned for five years. It's a very short reign. And within that, something like 280 people were executed for heresy, most of them being burned at the stake. That's something like three or four a week. And that doesn't include all of the others that were executed for other crimes, yeah? This is just the martyrs. So why burn them? Why burn them alive? Why not cut their heads off or hang them? Something like that. But it, from what I found out, it was all to do with the cleansing of the soul. If the body is burnt to ash, it's a punishment because they have no body to take in to the afterlife, heaven or hell. But there's also this business from the Spanish Inquisition who favored the burning of people because it goes against the Catholic doctrine to shed blood. So if you burn somebody alive, you're not shedding blood, are you? And there's another kind of sad twist here. They didn't strangle them before they killed them. Very often people who were burned at the stake, witches for instance, were strangled before they were set on fire. But if you were in Mary's time, found guilty of heresy and you're gonna burn, you're gonna take the pain. Now, I've made a model just to kind of show you how this was done. Now, you weren't just piled up with faggots of twigs, as they call it, or kindle. You were stood in an empty uh, barrel that used to contain pitch. So that eventually is gonna catch fire. All of your normal clothes are gone. You're in just your shirt or a shift. You're bound via the neck, the waist, and by your feet. So you are iron bound or chained to the post. If these bundles of wood are nice and dry, you're gonna go in, in, in minutes. If they're green, it's gonna take a long time. If there is wind, then it's gonna be a heck of a death. And can you imagine being burned alive? It must be one of the most painful ways to die than you can imagine. And I'm gonna show you a book here. Now, when Mary started her business of going against the Protestants, 800 notable Protestants 
left England. One of them was Fox, and he wrote a book, Fox's Book of Christian Martyrs. Um, a lot of people think this is uh, propaganda, but actually what it is, it, it's a record of those who literally were burnt to death. And I've, I've got one here. When I read it, I was heartbroken. When you read about John Hooper, he was watched and what they observed was in his house, he brought all the beggars and starving people into his house. And in his hall, they would be seen to be eating meat and bread. And he then wouldn't eat until they had had their fill and they had left. He was a really kind man. His servants gave evidence that every night he would feed the poor before himself. But of course, he'd been made a bishop in the reign of Edward VI, so he was Protestant. When Mary comes to the throne, he is questioned. He refuses to become a Catholic and follow the Catholic doctrine. He's put in prison 18 months. Then he's going to, 1555, he's going to be burnt at the stake. As they are putting the iron bands around him or chain him, he says, oh no, you don't need to do my feet and my neck. Just the one round the middle will suffice. And he says, and by the way, I forgive you. That's the man who's going to burn him alive. I forgive you. But what Hooper didn't realise was the fire had been made with green wood. Green wood doesn't burn very well. Takes 45 minutes in the flames to die. He is praying until his lips shrivel back. Then he is banging his chest until his hand actually sticks to the iron band and he's pulled and burned off. So he uses his other hand. I could go on, but some of this is so distressing even to a tough old guy like me and as it says in the end now he reigns as a blessed martyr in the joys of heaven it's impossible to read this without feeling compassion but i've got another one here it's the 13 that's all i'm going to say 13 are going to be burnt together self same thing they won't actually accept the Catholic faith. There are 11 men and two women. Uh, they try all the kind of tricks, what we call in the police, cross-serving. They, they put two separate uh, groups and told the one group that the other group had bubbled them, had told all the truth about them, but they wouldn't believe it. Then they were mocked and saying, oh, there are so many beliefs here, it's ridiculous. So they drew up one belief and they all signed it, the belief of the Protestant church. They burnt them. Two stakes, men were divided in half and fastened to the two stakes back to back and the two women were placed in between them. They weren't fastened and they were all burned alive. So the last one we're going to look at is uh, Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Cranmer, 21st of March, 1556. Now this is the guy who was forced to watch the double burning of his two friends, Latimer and Ridley. Can you imagine watching your friends burn alive. Archbishop Cranmer didn't want to die. He didn't want to be burnt alive. He was in shock. So he recanted the Protestant faith. He was made to write out two confessions which were then kept. But then he finds out they're going to kill him anyway. And he gives a sermon in St Mary's Church. But then it comes to the, to the end. And he goes, I, I, I confess because I fear death. Since my hand offended, it will be punished. This is the hand that signed the confession. When I come to the fire, it will be burned first. And as for the Pope, I refuse him as Christ's enemy and antichrist. And it goes on and people, oh my goodness me. But what can the Catholics now do to him? He's going to die. He's on his way to the fire. And when he arrives at the stake, takes off his clothes, he's got his long shirt, takes off his hat and everybody sees him for what he really is, an old man. He was bald, he got no hair on his head, a great big long beard. And both Catholics and Protestants alike, they felt sorry for this old man. Well, they bind him to the stake, they set it on fire, and what does he do? He says, this unworthy right hand, puts it into the fire 
and it catches fire and he holds it up. He is then consumed by the flames. Wow, what courage these people had. And that was the problem. All these people were being burnt. They weren't screaming and begging for mercy. They were praying. And it was backfiring because even some of Philip's own advisors, as well as Mary's, were saying, this is going to go wrong. You're going to turn people against the Catholic Church if we're not careful. The sad thing is, Mary desperately wanted an heir, a Catholic heir that would prevent her sister Elizabeth becoming queen and changing England back to being a Protestant state. But she didn't make it. She died of ovarian cancer, so we understand, 1558. Very sad at the end because her husband, Philip, actually abandoned her. So it's a real sad ending to this queen, who at the end of the day was following her faith. But did she deserve the title Bloody Mary? If you compare her to her father, I mean, her father had over 70,000, was it, executed in his reign? But it was the way Mary did it, the way she had those 280 souls burned alive. But that's down for you to decide. Let's see what you think in the comments. Well, I hope you found that video interesting, if not a little disturbing. If you did, like, share and subscribe. And don't forget, to turn on the all notification buttons because you just don't know what's coming down the line from the History Squad. But before I go, quick mention to a couple of our Patreon members, Pablo Pliskin and Andrew Placet. Now, Andrew, did I pronounce your name correctly? Let me know if I did or if I got it wrong. And as for everybody else, hey guys, thanks a million. See you soon.